Welcome to How Brands Are Built, where branding professionals get into the details of what they do and how they do it. I'm your host, Rob Meyerson. Thanks for listening. Today's episode is brought to you by Squad Help, the world's number one naming platform. To use Squad Help and launch a naming contest today, go to squadhelp.com and start receiving custom name suggestions instantly. This past season, I had a great time connecting with old peers like Miriam Stone, Tim Riches, and Arminio Putignano, as well as getting to talk to some other branding experts I'd previously only known through their writing and speaking engagements. Alan Adamson, Gareth Kay, Adam Morgan, Laura Reese, Marty Neumeyer, and David Ocker. I want to say a big thank you to all of them for joining me on the podcast and sharing their expertise. On today's episode, the last of season two, I'll be sharing five themes I noticed as I looked back on all nine interviews. These are ideas I felt like I was hearing again and again throughout the season. They're not necessarily the only themes or even the most important ones, but they stuck out to me and I wanted to share them. But before I start, a little housekeeping. Like I said, this is the final episode of the season, but not the end of this podcast. I've started making plans for season three, which should come out sometime later this year. Between now and then, look out for some great content on the website, howbrandsarebuilt.com. Please sign up for the newsletter and follow along on social media to get updates. Lastly, if you've just started listening, please subscribe, leave a rating and review at Apple Podcasts or your platform of choice, and don't forget to go back and check out some earlier episodes. Okay, let's get to those themes. Theme one. Thinking of brand strategy in terms of questions to be answered. An effective strategy should help you answer some critical questions about your business or brand. That might seem obvious, but it's a point that sometimes gets lost in discussions of brand frameworks and positioning statements. I think a lot of strategists, myself included, often fall into a trap of thinking about strategy in terms of these supposedly necessary components, things we've been taught to create, like brand pillars and personality traits. But the conversations I've had this season really reminded me of the importance of taking a step back and asking ourselves why we're creating these things. What's the point unless they're helping us come up with useful answers to important questions about the brand? In his latest book, Scramble, Marty Neumeyer lists what he calls the five cues or questions of strategy. Here's Marty talking about the first of the five questions, what is our purpose? Purpose is really the existential part of this whole whole branding thing. It's it's at the very top of the strategic pyramid. Mm-hmm. Um, it's you know why are we in business beyond making money? Uh, this is a question that a lot of companies didn't even dare ask themselves twenty thirty years ago because they were they were so afraid of alienating their shareholders. So right. they always thought our purpose is to make our shareholders rich. The other four cues of strategy listed in Marty's book are who do we serve. Where should we compete? How will we win? And how will we grow? And here's Adam Morgan of Eat Big Fish, who suggested brands should have a framing belief system, a perspective about what matters in the world and in the category. In a world of X, we believe in Y. I asked him whether answering that question, what is it that we believe about the world or the category, is something he covers in workshops with clients. Yes, absolutely. Um, but actually, that might be the second question, funny enough, because very often it's easier to get to what you believe by working out what you reject first. Mm. So a very good exercise is um, getting people to think about, from a category point of view, from a brand point of view, what is it that we hate most about this category? <laughs> what do we reject most? Uh, and actually, by working out what you hate and reject, and it's amazing the energy that comes out of that. <laughs> people really love hating, you know. Well, you know, then you can say, okay, well, if that's what we reject, so what is it then that we stand for and what do we believe? That becomes a much easier question to answer. Theme two, prototype, prototype, prototype. Whether or not they used the term prototype, quite a few guests this season brought up this idea to demonstrate or stress test a strategy by creating a few rough mock-ups or simple implementations. These prototypes can help ensure a strategy is actionable, ease decision-making between multiple strategic directions, and help sell in an abstract idea by making it more tangible. Here's Gareth Kay of Chapter. We have a mantra here, which is show the thing. Um, So it's about trying to bake the thinking that we're doing and the journey we're going on, not in words, but actually in things that a real person in the world 
might see or be exposed. It's not like making a fully blown thing, but it's prototyping Mm -hmm. what a brand might look, feel, behave like. So whether it's thinking about, you know, what might a poster for this brand look like or what might uh, an experience for this brand feel like, whether that's kind of a new product or whether that's a web experience. I think it's much more about trying to show the reality of the thing rather than having this kind of um, intermediation of the the words on a chart. Erminio Putignano, founding partner and managing director of Push, also mentioned validating a positioning platform by prototyping and progressively sharpening or fine-tuning a positioning platform. I asked him to clarify his process, whether when he's presenting strategy ideas before one path has even been selected, he also presents initial thoughts on implications to help the client visualize what each path could look like. Yeah, it's certainly very important. So already the the positioning platform that we would work on would try to be very single-minded in terms of what is that uh, core brand idea, but would also outline a series of uh, proof points uh, that touch on the many facets of the experience uh, about uh, that brand. But we also like to go a step further. Yes, helping the client, as you just said, visualize. And in particular, visualize what this brand could be, this is so what, across what are the key expression of that uh, brand. Again, could be the evolution of a visual and verbal identity, could be the brand environment, uh, could be even implication on the culture of the organization. At that stage, you may not crack it completely. You are not offering the full solution, but you're helping the client imagine, see the possibilities of what that brand could be once it is fully implemented. Theme three, keep it simple. This one won't be a surprise to anyone in branding, and it may even earn an eye roll from some of you. But because it came up in multiple interviews and because of the way it came up and the context within which it came up, I wanted to include it. First, we'll hear from Alan Adamson, co-founder and managing partner of Metaforce. He wrote a whole book about keeping brand simple, titled, appropriately, Brand Simple. We've all seen complicated-looking brand frameworks with all the boxes and lines arranged in some sort of shape like a pyramid or a house. We'll talk about those more in Theme 5. They don't always seem simple, so I asked Alan about how he recommends documenting what a brand stands for, whether he includes all those various components like brand personality, brand pillars, and so on. Here's his answer. You sort of need all that, but if you try to get all that into what you want to stand for, by the time you finish writing your brand platform, (laughs) you'll be out of business. I always (laughs) like to think that the most important thing is to figure out what's the point of your story? What's the what's the starting point? You know, get some focus. It could be about what you do. could be about how you do it. You know, could be about your purpose. <laughs> it could be about, you know, why you do something, your, your mission and your uh, vision. And it could be about, you know, who you are, your personality. Uh, but for sure, if you try to make it about everything, uh, only you will know what your brand stands for, and you'll never be able to get it out because great execution, great branding requires real tight focus and simplicity. And so, yes, you need all that, but if you throw everything but the kitchen sink at the wall, you're you're not going to have a powerful brand. Miriam Stone, an independent strategist in the Bay Area and strategy director at Noise 13, talked specifically about writing a brand essence and the importance of keeping it short but powerful. I almost always would do that sort of essence line at the end. Uh I find it because that is really the distillation of all distillations, right? Right, So you need to, at least for me, I need to know everything else going into it first to know whether I've got it. It's the line where I I think of it almost like brand poetry, you Mm -hmm. know, where it's like, there's no, no words to spare. And so every word needs to have meaning, often double meaning, but it also needs to sound good and be powerful. It's really hard. It's the kind of thing you have to write and then rewrite and then rewrite Mm -hmm. until it's truly as simple as possible. I think you always have to ask yourself, are there extraneous words that can go? You know, how can you whittle it down as narrow as possible? The more words, the more distracting it is. Theme four, the importance of category. Create a category. It's a mantra I've heard since day one of my branding career. But it's easier said than done, and to be honest, I've never been entirely sure it's useful advice. It seems to be more like a result than a strategy, like the time someone told me their client's brand strategy was to be number one. 
We look back on category creators like Red Bull and give them credit for their foresight, but attributing Red Bull's success to their creation of the energy drink category feels like maybe an oversimplification. And you could certainly say Netflix created the DVD by mail category, but was that a brand strategy or a business model? If you're working on a brand strategy for your existing business, I'm just not sure how useful the Netflix case study is, but maybe I'm just not thinking big enough. And then there's the hair-splitting wordplay approach to creating a category. You know, it's not fast food, it's fast casual. We're not an energy drink, we're an energy shot. Or even, it's not just another cigarette, it's toasted. Without a Netflix-like innovation, I worry striving to create a category can result in this kind of meaningless fluff that gives marketing a bad name. But two guests mentioned this idea and made me question my point of view. First, we'll hear from Laura Reese. Laura's a best-selling author and president at Reese & Reese, the consulting firm she runs with her father, Al Reese. Al co-authored the brand strategy classic, Positioning. I talked to Laura about what positioning means, and she didn't waste much time getting to the idea of category. Positioning has and always will be is about owning an idea in the mind. Um, and strong brands own a position, if you will. Mm -hmm. And that position, if you are creating a new category, it tends to be that category. So Red Bull owns the energy drink category because it is the leader and it was, you know, the, the first pioneer of that category. And that's really the strongest position you can own in the mind is dominating a category that is, you know, growing and is important. Kodak dominated the film photography category. It owned that position in the mind, but that no longer is a powerful position, right? Um, not because Kodak did anything, but because that category went away. Right. And, that, and that means that the category is incredibly important, and that's a, a critical part of positioning as we know it today. And David Ocker, who some call the father of modern branding, made the idea of what he calls subcategory competition one of just a handful of big ideas about branding in his recent book, Ocker on Branding. The idea is that we're moving, we need to move from brand competition to subcategory competition if you want to grow. If you look at category after category and you see spurts of growth, they're always caused, almost always caused by somebody that's invented a, some kind of a must have, changes what people buy, created a new subcategory, and then managed that subcategory to to grow. And so you have things like the, the Prius and the uh, minivan that Chrysler came out, both of which lasted 16 years with no competition, no competition. Chrysler made 12 million vehicles with no competition until finally Honda and Toyota came out with a competitor. And that sort of, I mean, that's the way to grow. And my brand versus is better than your brand competition is not only not fun, but it almost never results in, in real growth. So that makes a, a change in, in business strategy. You have to put a little bigger bet on big innovations instead of, of marginal innovations. And uh, we have to recognize opportunities when they emerge because they don't emerge every day. This episode of How Brands Are Built is brought to you by Squad Help, the world's number one naming platform. Here's how Squad Help works. You launch a naming contest to engage hundreds of naming experts. You're guided through an agency-level naming process that goes beyond traditional crowdsourcing. The platform uses AI and includes name validation features such as audience testing, trademark validation, linguistic analysis, and quality scoring. And Squad Help doesn't just do naming. You can also use their platform for taglines or slogans, as well as logo design. To launch your naming contest today, go to squadhelp.com and start receiving custom name suggestions instantly. Squad Help, company, brand, and business name ideas by experts. Today's episode is also brought to you by Rev.com, offering fast, affordable, accurate audio transcription and captions. I use Rev all the time to transcribe episodes of this podcast and also for recorded interviews I conduct during brand strategy projects for clients. I've tried some other services, and I keep coming back to Rev because their transcriptions are the most accurate I've seen, their turnaround time is less than 24 hours, and transcriptions cost just $1 a minute. Right now, Rev is offering listeners of this show $10 off your first order. To get your $10 off coupon, visit rev.com slash blog slash HBAB for how brands are built. Again, that's rev.com slash blog slash H-B-A-B. Rev. Transcriptions made simple. 
Theme five, the flexibility of brand frameworks. This last theme involves one of the biggest questions I had coming into this season. I've worked at or with probably over a dozen brand consultancies, including the biggest in the world and some of the smallest. All of them use some brand framework or model, a so-called brand on a page, those pyramids and houses I mentioned earlier in the episode. They have words and boxes representing components that every brand should supposedly have, like brand pillars and personality. I've had conversations, debates you might even call them, with very smart strategists about things like how many pillars are allowed, what parts of speech belong in a brand essence, and whether brand personality traits should be one or two words each. I've had clients ask me these questions as if the success of their brand hangs on whether the heading on that third brand pillar starts with an adverb like the other two do. Look, I'm a big believer in the power of words, but at some point, you got to ask yourself, are we getting a little carried away with all this? So I asked every interviewee how they think about brand platforms and what, if any, framework they use when creating one. I also did a little research on my own, reading up on some of the more academic approaches to this question. At one extreme, I've seen models that seem to allow for ultimate flexibility – Just write down the most important things about the brand in no particular order, or maybe try to prioritize them and arrange them top to bottom or with the most important idea in the middle and less important ideas in concentric circles moving out from the center. On the other hand, I've worked with extremely rigid frameworks, four pillars, four personality traits with a one-to-one mapping between them, each pair with its own set of proof points. And given these two extremes, it was no surprise when my guests seemed to have varying opinions on this topic. Let's go back to Gareth Kay again. He's the co-founder of Chapter in San Francisco. He argues in favor of more flexibility and less wordsmithing. We've got a couple of problems. Um, One is language and words by themselves are a very lossy form of compression. I mean, we're trying to pack very complex ideas, quite often quite intangible, soft ideas into words. And the danger becomes we don't really pick very good words that really capture that sentiment because they're just hard to find. And then secondly, those words get misconstrued Mm -hmm. um, in terms of what their meaning are, depending on who you are, the context you see those words in, et cetera. So there's kind of an issue, I think, with trying to use words as a medium for getting across the sensibility of a brand. Secondly, I just think all the tools we build are designed to be I would argue less about distillation and more about kind of reduction. And, you know, I'm a big believer that simplicity is really, really important and really, really powerful. Um, But that should be distillation of uh, thinking that leads to simplicity rather than kind of maybe slightly kind of brutal reduction where we're kind of chopping off arms and limbs uh, to get to something, which I think is far too often the case in terms of those models. On top of that, I would just say, that those are models that were built to basically build consensus Mm -hmm. inside client organizations. They're built to, frankly, stand alone on one page on a chart. So you get to, you know, the temples and the brand pyramids and the brand keys, all of which, you know, have got some value. I'm not trying to kind of say they are meaningless, but I think we put way too much weight on, you know, what these words mean. You end up having, you know, far too many meetings as my friend Russell Davis used to kind of, you know, complain about where you'll be discussing whether a brand is funny or whether it's humorous and literally spending, you know, four months and umpteen dollars in research to try and disentangle this. You kind of go, is that really the best use of our time, of our money, of our resources? But Chapter does use a model of sorts in which they'll identify a client's sort of core belief, its purpose, and multiple pursuits falling out of that purpose. I'll let you go back to that episode if you want to hear Gareth explain it in more detail and give an example. Next up, I'll play some dialogue between me and Tim Riches, Group Strategy Director at Principles in Melbourne. Tim and I talked about an article he recently wrote in which he contends the role of a branding agency is to build a bridge on behalf of their clients between the promise of the brand and the delivery of that promise. And to do that, he says, we need to be able to convey the intangible ideas for which the brand stands in a way that someone, experienced designers, for example, can make sense of in order to create the right tangible manifestations of those ideas. 
Here's a little of my conversation with Tim. If there's no structure, then you can't build a bridge. That'd be my point. Mm. Because the bridge is built on that intellectual um, sort of connectivity or or the fact that, I mean, I don't know why this is, and I don't pretend that this is in any way scientific, but from my experience, we tend to naturally land on four pillars. And and I've, I suppose, over the years come back to some of the simple tests, like what are we famous for? That's, in my mind, the idea of the brand pillar. I suppose sometimes that word attribute is used. Right. I like the word pillar. The reason the word I like the word pillar is the word pillar evokes the fact that they play a supporting role, that they ladder up to something. And I think this is the problem with the random parking lots kind of scenario. Mm-hmm. Nothing ladders up to anything else. So if you think you want to own a big idea in people's minds, how the hell do you connect the complexity of my values, my brand personality traits, and, and my and my the, my attributes or pillars, to bring up that big idea. How do you define what is a proof point? Right. How do you give kind of coherence? How do you create principles that people can use to simply ask themselves, "Am I, you know, if I'm doing some innovation work, am I? How should I think about how different innovation ideas further my brand?" Or if I'm doing, you know, things like, you know, copywriting or checking things for sort of tonal correctness and that sort of thing, you know, what checkboxes can I, simple checkboxes can I equip the increasingly large population of content creators to work with to deliver stuff that feels like it comes and it has a voice and it has a point of view and has a, and has a tone, a style, a personality that is consistent with the business strategy. I don't see how you can create a cohesive story unless there is some relationship. I know typically I, the way we tend to do it or the way I, I've always done it, I guess, is to try and create almost a vertical alignment between things. Right. At least trying to do that helps you show where you have disjoints and incongruities within the thinking, you know? So a vertical alignment meaning, for example, that you, you do have, say, four pillars that you would then also have for, say, brand personality traits, and there would be a one-to-one mapping between them. And it, it sounds like you're saying you're doing that less because you think it's a rule or something like that, that that people should follow in order to be doing brand strategy properly, and more because it's a useful test as to whether your thinking makes sense, as to whether there's any coherence or structure to your thinking. Correct. So, if you have company values and company purpose, that when you feed them in, if, you know, if there's four or five company values, if you try and line them up with the four pillars, for example, that you're trying to create for this brand, if there's no relationship, you're in deep shit, right? Because <laughs> your values, surely you are, because you know, you're, you're trying to engage your organization. If you're not trying to engage your organization around its values and hold ourselves and each other accountable to those values then why do you have the values, right? Sure, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you need that relationship to be one-to-one, right? It could be that one of those values really supports two of the pillars and, and so on. Correct. Yeah, and you typically end up with a little bit of a, you end up with a bit of a patchwork of these things. But but by trying to align them, mm-hmm. you quickly and clearly identify where you might have a value that is actually at odds with and therefore highly dilutive with one of your brand pillars. I see. I always call it the gold medal. If you can get one-to-one relationships across everything, I think it does hugely help to to deliver some simplicity and some coherence overall. It happens, in my experience, about one time out of ten that you actually get there. But by trying, you get, I think, a really good. You create a framework for a great, healthy discussion with your client about what fits and what doesn't fit. What are we doing? Where are we pulling in opposite directions? And where are we well aligned? And lastly, here's David Ocker again. One of David's claims to fame is his brand vision model, which many people refer to as the Ocker model. Look up an image of it, and at first you'll think it's another one of those complicated prescriptive models with lots of boxes that have to be filled in with exactly the right kinds of ideas. In fact, it's on the flexible end of the spectrum I described earlier. Here's David describing it and explaining why he created it in the first place. I had three or four premises that I began with. I was just so convinced that the agency model of running bands was wrong. Mm-hmm. And, and that was you develop a three-word phrase, a single thought, a single concept, and then you develop a campaign around it. And I thought brands are uh, certainly B2B brands, but in any brand, it's got multiple dimensions. It's not just a three-word phrase. So that was a, f- a fundamental idea of mine that it, you have to allow a brand to stand for you know, more than one thing, maybe six or 12 things. 
And the second thing I really uh, disliked was this fill in the box model. I, I've been, I was a, an advisor for one of the major global agencies, and they had this fill in the box model that just drove me crazy. <laughs> they would have eight boxes, and you had to fill in each one. And of course, it was really designed around B two C things because that was most of their clients. And and if you were a B two B business, there was no box for organizational values, right. and so you didn't have it. And and there was a box for brand personality. So even though that wasn't relevant to your brand, had no place in a brand vision, you had to fill in the box. It was borderline tragic. <laughs> so anyway, the, those really were the two things. So. In my first version of the brand identity model, I didn't even not have a brand essence, right? Because I was so, you know, I, I was so attuned to the fact I didn't want a three-word phrase to appear anywhere, and I later added a brand essence because it turns out for a large percentage of the cases that's helpful, mm-hmm. and it's not always helpful, but in large percentage of the cases it is. So I added that, but uh, so the the idea is you. You decide, you sit down and say, what do I want my brand to stand for in, in customers' minds? And then you, you make a list, and then you consolidate that list, but you don't have any limit. It can be three, it can be six, it can be nine, it can be 12, mm-hmm. and so on. And then after you're done, you prioritize those. You pick out three or four or five that are the most important, and then at the core, right. and then you pick out the rest are extended identity, which plays a really useful role because they provide extra texture and guidance for something that's not front and center. In his books, David lists ideas of what those core and extended elements of a brand could be. But he's quick to point out those are just suggestions, a way to ensure you've considered every possibility rather than a prescription for the right way to build a brand strategy. So did Gareth, Tim, and David present alternative views of the right way to build a brand platform? Or is there a way to reconcile their points of view? Tim wasn't arguing for rigidity so much as coherence, which doesn't necessarily preclude the kind of flexibility Gareth and David were advocating. To be honest, I'm still thinking through what I heard, whether there's a debate here, and if so, which side of it I'd come down on. I'm generally against anything too prescriptive or dogmatic, but I also agree with Tim's point about ensuring some inherent logic in the work. I'll keep thinking about it, and if you're interested, I'm sure I'll write something about it soon. In the meantime, I'd love to hear your thoughts. That's it for the five themes, but I've got one more treat for you. If you've been listening along all season, you've heard me ask many of my guests what advice they'd give to younger or more junior people in the industry or anyone looking to get into the industry or become a stronger strategist or branding professional. What you're about to hear is a series of back-to-back clips from Laura Reese, Erminio Putignano, Gareth Kay, Adam Morgan, David Ocker, Tim Riches, Marty Neumeyer, and Alan Adamson. First and foremost, get out there, you know, meet a lot of different types of people, work with a lot of different types of companies, get as much experience um, as you can working with, um, you know, different companies in different cities and different people in different countries. Um, I think there's a a lot you can you can absorb by just seeing how things work in different places. And and then you'll be able to feel because I think really what a consultant does is, you know, they they work off their experience. Um, And what young people don't have is they don't have a lot of experience. If you as a young practitioner have the chance to identify an agency, an environment, a workplace, that can be a good school for you, where you can receive good mentorship, uh, be guided, especially in your early years of your career, stick to it, go there, uh, and uh, try to learn as much as you can as a sponge. This is very important. I'm saying this because uh, one of the other trends that I've seen uh, over the last years is that uh, young people... uh, Uh, And fair enough, they are right. They want soon to go out and set up their own agency, their own practice and conquering the world. And all this entrepreneurial spirit is absolutely very valuable and to appreciate. What happens is that I find people that have enormous potential, that have almost gone solo a little bit too early. Mm -hmm. And after a few years, they've realized almost that probably they've not really defined a particular approach, a particular methodology. Almost they don't have a particular point of view 
that has been nurtured and tested to give them confidence to go to the next level. So my recommendation is this, yes, try new things, set up your company, do all these different stuff, but also be able to acknowledge the importance of almost joining an environment and a team of people that can be a little bit as a school in your early stages of your career. The pat answer is, do everything you can to be curious about the world you live in. So stop reading advertising books, advertising blogs, marketing books, marketing blogs, etc., etc., and take time to observe the world around you. Get off your computer, get off your phone, walk around, listen to people's conversations, try and find interesting stuff that's going on in culture and think about what you can learn from it and build that kind of bank of just rich stuff in the world to learn from. I think that's one really important thing I would ask people to do because I think you just fill your mind with just really interesting random stuff I think the second thing is um, maximize your chance of interesting collisions being formed and building uh, an interesting take on the type of work you do and that's really about being less obsessed about the companies you work for and the brands you work on and really spotting really interesting, generous people to work with who have different takes on what strategy is and can be. Because I'm a big believer. There's a great uh, adage that uh, Jeremy Bullmore from WPP Mm -hmm. uses about how brands are built like birds um, build their nest from the kind of scraps and straws they chance upon. Mm -hmm. I think the, the same is true of how you build up your planning or strategy style. I think you've got to have an angle. I've got a friend in in the States who's um, a writer and has been a journalist and writes speeches called Paul Pendergrass. And he has a model, um, which he calls Scoop Angle Voice. And essentially it says that if you're writing a story, there are three things you can have. So the first is you can have a scoop. You can notice something happening that nobody has reported on before. But very few people can have a scoop, right? Very few people get a scoop ever in their lives as, as marketers or brands or kind of journalists. The second thing you can have is an angle. You can have a perspective on that story that nobody's had before. So you can have a view about why it happened or what should happen as a result of it or that kind of thing. And most great journalism is about people taking a very particular and very distinctive angle. And the third is you can have a voice. You can have a kind of a depth and a kind of robustness with the way you you discuss it that nobody's decided. I'm very struck by, in the consultancy business, how few people have an angle. I'm struck by how in the agency business, how few advertising agencies who spend all their time advising clients about brand positioning, how few of them have an angle. They don't. They talk, mm-hmm. they talk about ideas. You know, we believe in great ideas. Well, everybody believes in great ideas. What's your angle? So I think have an angle and stick to it uh, and actually then do the research around it that gives you confidence and authority and a kind of mandate to pursue it. It's such a simple and obvious idea. It's startling how little it happens. Well, I think that companies today and not only client companies, but consulting companies are just absolutely terrified about becoming relevant in the digital age. And one of the advantages you have as as somebody who's coming out of college or graduate school is that you're young and you understand social media. Mm -hmm. So it wouldn't hurt to go in as a social media specialist or as an analytical specialist if you happen to be good at statistics and and so forth, to to be a data analyst because, I mean, they're just desperate for people that can do analytical work or even if they can interact with people that do analytical work, even if they understand it. So I think that those are two ways to open the door. Being focused on the problem that you're solving or what is the most important problem to solve or, and, or, or slash what does value look like for the client is such a critical thing to bear in mind. As, as a strategy practitioner, it's super easy to get sort of drawn into, you know, I mean, I find, I find this even more the case in areas like human-centered design. Practitioners get fucking obsessed with methodology. And you get these people that become methodology evangelists, mm-hmm. which I, I, I don't get that. I, I don't. <laughs> and, and, yeah, I think it's quite easy for people earlier in their career because methodology is easily learned and it's codified and you can go learn it from, you know, you go to bloody you know, go learn it from IDEO or somewhere like that, right? Mm-hmm. And they're not in the conversation, right? They're not in 
they're not in that higher, more senior conversation. Because the, the senior conversations around why are we doing this and what does good look like, which people like me have with clients, mm-hmm. there's a version of that way of thinking that needs to be embraced by younger people, particularly by more junior people, I should say, particularly in very amorphous areas like brand. It's super important that you have that. I met one of the early art directors of Graphis, and uh, I, we had a conversation, and he says, look, I'm going to give you some advice. <laughs> I didn't ask for it. He just had to give it to me. Uh, I said, okay, uh, wh- what is it? He goes, well, I first have to ask you. He's a Swiss guy. He says, I first, ha- I first have to ask you, um, is your desk against the wall, or is it out in the open? And I said, well, it's, it's out in the open. He goes, well, that's good. I said, okay. He says, uh, well, here's what you do. Here's my advice. When you're finished with your your design, walk around to the other side of your desk. I said, and? He goes, no, that's it. That's it. And I, I just, a big smile crept across my face because I realized what he was trying to tell me. It was a metaphor. So he says, you know, look at your work from the other side. Mm-hmm. From the customer's point of view. From the customer's point of view, and it stuck with me, and that eventually led to the brand gap because I realized, you know, you gotta. It's not what you say it is; it's what they say it is. The brand belongs to customers; they decide what the brand. It's your reputation, and they they decide what it is. And you can affect that reputation by what you do, how you behave, and what what materials you share with them, what the products do, and all that kind of stuff. But ultimately, they decide. So you have to start with that and work backwards. I always tell people to, you know, if they're not thinking about what they do when they're at the gym or running in the park, then do what you're thinking about when you're running in the park or at the gym. Don't look at your job as something, oh, I've got to go to the office and answer 400 emails and, you know, by 4.30 I'll be able to get out. So the people that love what they do, I I always met, when I met founders of successful companies throughout my career, my father-in-law was in the shopping mall business. Uh, And I said, you know, what's so exciting about that? But he would take me on Saturdays and we'd walk the mall. It was a guided tour of a mall. Why was a food court here? Why was a sneaker store next to a sock store? And he was passionate about mall. See, and he was there on a Saturday and Sunday loving it. And so whatever you, you know, choose to do, do something you love doing because you'll do it better over time than if you're there just to make a buck. That's the end of season two. For more, you can go back and listen or read transcripts from this season and last on howbrandsarebuilt.com. While you're there, you can find more content on brand positioning, as well as a list of books recommended by each guest this season. Thanks to all of you for listening to the show, and especially to everyone who subscribed, left a rating or review, signed up for the newsletter, or connected on social media. If you haven't done those things, please do. I really appreciate the support, and it helps ensure, eventually, a season three of How Brands Are Built. How Brands Are Built is a production of Heirloom Agency, LLC. Our theme music is by Isha Erskine Project. I'm Rob Meyerson, and I'll talk to you next time. Thanks again. Thanks again.